Good evening and welcome to another episode of JMU Sound Off. Uh, John has the night off. He's on vacation with his family. But we do have a great episode tonight. Uh, Xavier Brown is back with us to talk about how the basketball season ended in the tournament and his return to JMU. We also have linebacker Jacob Dobbs on the episode to talk about foot, spring football. And we'll wrap up with Dave Rigger. We'll talk all things JMU sports and just kind of go around the horn and uh, see what's going on in the world of JMU. But first, I do want to mention our sponsors. I really have to say thank you to Skyline Financial. They've been with us since our first shows and have been great supporters of the show. If you have financial planning needs or questions where you'd even start, contact Tim Nelson, the guys at Skyline Financial at SkylineFinancialPartners.com. Also, we got to thank our newest sponsor at Where's Woody. You've seen the gear on the Pat McAfee show. We've talked about some of the NIL deals they've put together for JMU athletes, and we're very thankful for the support of the show. Do go and check out their merchandise and apparel at Where'sWoody.com. And last but certainly not least, special thanks to the Montpelier Collective. Visit the MontpelierCollective.com. Find ways to support our current student athletes and give them the resources that they need. And with that, let's bring on the other hosts of the show, Michael Evangelista and Steve Brown. How are you guys doing tonight? What's up, guys? Good, afternoon. Good evening. Hey, man. All right. Well, uh, first of all, let's give a quick shout out. Uh, Jamie Baseball. We had a little bit of a sweep, their first conference sweep of the season, and drum roll, it was against the App State Mountaineers. So it's always good to put them in their place, especially after a couple of times they've gotten us this year. But want to do a shout out to the Jamie baseball team at the top of the episode. But uh, let's go around the horn real quick, talk about all things Jamie. Michael, how you doing? I'm doing well. I was going to say, I feel like it's been a couple of weeks since we've, we've uh, gotten back together. So I miss you guys. Um, it's been a crazy last couple of weeks. We're back in Virginia now, thank goodness. Um, but you know, been to a couple of practices for Jamie football, love what we're seeing on the field. It's been some beautiful Saturdays um in Harrisonburg the last couple of weeks. So excited to be back here and talk Dukes. And Steve, I know you've been out to Jamie football, but also you took a trip out uh to a rich University of Richmond the other day to see the, the Dukes take on Richmond and lacrosse. It was great. Um, oh, it's always good to go back to that uh, crappy little high school stadium that sits in the uh, west end of Richmond. So it's a beautiful campus. It's it's a shame that they can't get by to show up. We had twice as many lacrosse fans there than were UR fans. Um, the announcer was kind of lame. So every time he would do our announcing of a goal, I would take it over and just scream out what was going on. Um, and they just, you know, smacked them like they should. So it was good to see them get that win and then come back home and, and get a win against a really good Temple team yesterday for senior day. Uh, they were down. They had to come back uh, to win that game and, and won it convincingly. So, um, And same thing with the uh, App State guys. I, I like it when they show up with their five teeth because that's all they've got. And they just lost all five of those teeth this weekend when they got them bashed in by the JMU baseball team. So it's never a bad day when you beat a Mountaineer ever. Yeah, and, and I, you know I know we were going to have a heavy, heavy show on uh, on basketball and football, but did want to shout out uh, two programs, spring programs that right now are, are getting national accolades. I know uh, the Jamie baseball team right now, I believe, top twenty five in RPI, one of the toughest schedules in the country. Uh, not only do they have three top twenty five wins right now, but they are one of only three teams to knock off number one Arkansas, who is currently twenty six and three. So uh, shout out to all the spring sports, but uh, we do want to dive into some of the bigger stories that we've had in the last couple of weeks. And one of the biggest stories is, uh, well, since the last time we met, uh, we went on a little postseason run in the NCAA tournament. We lost our coach. We got our new coach. But one of the big storylines is one of our favorite players, probably one of my favorite players across any sport all time at JMU, Xavier Brown, has decided to come out of the transfer portal, come back to home to JMU. And I can tell him that uh, me, along with the rest of JMU Nation, was uh, was doing a little bit of a celebratory dance last week when he made that announcement. So, Xavier Brown, thank you so much for coming back on the show tonight. Thank you guys for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to be up here with you guys, man. And uh, like I said, I mean, April Fools. It was almost April Fools, but nah, I'm just kidding. But I just, I, I just wanted to um, just say that I'm super thankful to be back up here, man. It's always fun being up here with you guys. Well, I know uh, there's a lot of questions the guys want to ask about the tournament, the team, the coach, everything. But I wanted to kind of start off tonight. Um, you know, every time transfer portal season comes around, a lot of people all over social media, a lot of fans that quite honestly, not only have they never been student athletes, but even if they have been student athletes in the past, they've never experienced this iteration of college athletics. So I would love for you to kind of give your first person perspective of, of what does the transfer portal, the timelines look like for a student athlete in your position and kind of 
talk about what the, the big picture for that is for people that really have no idea? Um, so first, I would say it's not as difficult as everybody thinks it is to get in the transfer portal. Um, you just kind of watch a video on NCAA letting you know, let, like laying out all the rules um, and regulations that apply. And um, I talk, I, you email your, uh, I, well, Stephen Laporta for us, but your compliance members, and um, they put you in the portal. And then after that, you're uh, eligible to start talking to coaches again and stuff like that. So um, honestly, it's like speed dating. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of it. Um, a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches really were reaching out last week. I probably talked to about 30 to 35 coaches and my phone was ringing nonstop, honestly. Um, so basically you enter it and anybody that wants to contact you can contact you. So I talked to about 30, 35 different schools last week and wow. it was crazy. It's a lot to take in. Yeah, I'm sure. I was going to say, Xavier, like when you went to the transfer portal, especially after the Sun Belt Championship game and obviously the run into the tournament, uh, we felt like you'd be a hot commodity and we love the fact that you're coming back um, to JMU. So tell us a little bit more about what brought you back to Harrisonburg, sort of like some insights coming out of the portal. You mentioned you had so many coaches talking to you and then we hired coach P from Moorhead state that like talk about building a program from the ground up with, you know, we always talk about limited resources and going to the tournament and now come coming to JMU with just like a wealth of people and support. Um, tell me a little bit about what that meant to you and why you decided to come back to, to be a Duke. Um, honestly, to begin the last week, um, I was just talking to a bunch of coaches and they tell, I mean, I really quickly realized that because before in my high school years, I didn't really have many coaches reaching out to me. So mm. it was like, Jamie was one of my only options. And, um, so I wasn't really used to like getting a ton of calls. I mean, my phone was ringing. I was in class. Like, my phone was ringing. Uh, I come home, take my dog for a walk. My phone was ringing. So, um, it was a lot. And, um, just to. I mean, I was me personally. I tell you guys this. I was I wasn't gonna make a decision until GMU hired a coach. I feel like the school took a chance on me coming out of high school. So the least that I could do is give them a chance to prove themselves to hire somebody that they believe can lead this program. And um, so that was my big thing that I wasn't gonna make a decision until um, until uh, the GMU hired hired a coach. One, um, two. Coach P is a great, great, great person. I talked, like I said, I probably talked to about 30 to 35 schools last week, and um, all of them talked basketball, X's and O's. Sure. But Coach, Coach P, it was about real life, how he can help me become a better man, you know, stuff like that. And that's all I could ever want because one day the ball is going to stop bouncing. And, and then what happens after that, you know? Um, so Coach P is a great, great coach already. He's proven he's won two championships and um, he's been to March Madness a couple of times. He coached under Coach Calipari for 10 years, so he knows how to get talent to the NBA. So um, I believe in him, and uh, he's such a family-oriented person. He's a family-oriented guy, and that's all I ever want um, is, is a family here. And um, a legacy, that's that's honestly why I did not leave. Um, I want to build my own legacy here, and I feel like we have something great really going on right now, and um, everybody's getting up out of here, and I love JMU for what it is. There's no culture like it. So, yeah. I mean, you can't find this culture anywhere else. I mean, how many schools can say that their women's soccer, men's soccer, uh, went to the NCAA tournament, their basketball uh, program, women's basketball was one, one or two possessions away from it. Football had a bowl game. Lacrosse is doing well. So, I mean, we're an everything school, and we really do stand by that. So it'd be hard to find an everything school anywhere else, you know? Love it. And for our listeners out there, I just want to let you know that we did not give Xavier a script just now. It kind of came off the tongue in terms of us being in everything school. I, lo I love the enthusiasm you have for the program and just JMU as a whole. It, it def we definitely share the same. Um, love to kind of hear, you know, Coach P coming out from Moorhead State. I think his point guard two or three years ago was conference player of the year. I'd love to kind of hear, like, does he have plans for you? Or, like, did he kind of share, like, how he wants to use you in his schemes? Almost oh, definitely, you know, he's a defensive oriented coach. And if, if you watch me play, you know what side of the ball I enjoy being on more. Uh, so I think last episode we called you Rajon Rondo 2.0, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for him to just have a program that he had seven players that he played in, and I mean, he wasn't really deep. He lost his conference player of the year at the beginning of the season last year. Didn't have him the entire year and then won the conference again and didn't have someone else step up to be the conference player of the year. That says a lot about who he how he is coaching so my doubt was never about the coaching uh like or, or what he's capable of because obviously we see what he's done with Moorhead and built that program up so I have no doubt that he's going to step into this job at GMU with more resources and uh different uh the same coaching staff 
Uh, he also has Coach Baker, who's also a great, great, great coach. So, um, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. Once I saw that we landed him, I just wanted to talk to him a little bit and see what, see how he was as a person. And I mean, he exceeded, exceeded all expectations. So you had some really good other places that were calling you, but, and I'm not going to get into those because that's not my place, but what really brought you back really to come back to JMU? I mean, you, you could have gone to power five. There's a variety of places you could have gone. What really brought you back? Um, just the culture. Like I said, um, I, I, I wrote a statement um, the day that I decided to come back and I want to read it out. Um, there's a multitude of reasons and deciding factors that went into making this decision to stay. But first of all, I mean, obviously the talent and passion of the coaches that are coming in to the program is one huge thing. Um, I'm really excited um, that I can be myself and growing as a player here. Like I grow, I, I've grown so much as a person and a player at the school. So um, that's just something that not one specific person has, you know, dawned on, on me. It's just like, and then the energy between the fans um, I really feel like I have family here. I meet new people all the time and um, it's always, it's easy to interact with people here. And I, I feel like that'd be hard to find anywhere else. So um, our culture uh, as a school, as a, as a, you know, uh, university is just, it's outstanding. And I don't think I could find it anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, make sure, here's the one thing I wish they'd have told me when I was at JMU. I did some of this, but I didn't do enough of it. I want you and Jacob and anybody else that's listening out there that's a student athlete, lean on the alums. Um, we're there to help you. Um, we're there to help you in life. We're there to help you in job searches. We're there to help you once basketball's over. We're there to help you now. So just feel free. That's not my question, but I just want to at least throw that out there for you that, you know, we're all here to help you. That's what makes JMU different. I had to help in 1981 through 84. Um, I left a semester early, which I probably shouldn't have, should have stayed one more semester. <laughs> but um, just let us help. So I'll leave that out there. But the other question I want to get with you is tell them, tell everybody what it was like in Brooklyn. I, I was there um, sitting kind of halfway up. You know, I was so glad they put your families down front, which was smart. Um, I was about row 12 in that section. Tell everybody what it was like on Friday and Saturday night and how loud it was, because nobody really believes me that it was louder than the AUBC, which I didn't think it could be. But I mean, just tell everybody the experience and kind of what it was like. Um, it's unexplainable. And it's something that I, I told Coach Baker this when we got back. It's something that you work your entire life for and you get there and it happens and then it's over. And then it's like, well, we got to get right back. Like you, you, it's such a great feeling to be in um, March Madness. Like it's just insane. Um, but the jam you support, I mean, when I found out that we were going to Brooklyn and I realized that how many jer people that we have from New Jersey and Virginia is not far. I mean, I knew that we would have fans there, but Oh my goodness. I remember before the game, I'm tying my shorts up and I'm just looking around and there's a little patch of red and white Wisconsin, but everywhere else that I looked, I mean, I saw nothing but purple. And um, so, I mean, to, to beat them from beginning to end, it was just crazy. I remember the, it was about the eight minute mark left in the game and all I hear is jam you chance. It's like something that you like, it's like a weird moment where you're like trying to stay focused inside of the game, but like, we all heard it and we were just looking at each other like we got them like this is it. We just have to close the game out. And um, it was just super, super, super loud, man. I felt like I was in the AUBC. Barclays felt like home for a little bit. So it was cool to be in there. And um, the arena's huge. It was really hard to shoot there. I'll be completely honest. Uh, they have black. It's like black all around. You guys were there and the depth perception's a little weird. So it was super cool to be a part of. And I cannot wait to get back, man. Well, I, I just can't help but think that. You know, one of the teams playing tomorrow night in the national championship, um, that Wisconsin team beat two games before y'all played them. And um, and again, it wasn't like a back and forth or Wisconsin having a bad night. I mean, you guys owned that game from start to finish. They never had the lead. And um, I think when you look at that game, you look at how you started the season with Michigan State, and then you just see how, I mean, you you, you tore through the Sun Belt Conference, you tore through the out of out – of, uh, out of conference schedule. It's just, this is going to be one of those basketball seasons. We've already talked about this, but it's going to be one of those basketball seasons that a lot of people are going to remember. And a lot of relationships were able to kind of rally around this moment. So um, the, the one thing I kind of wanted to wrap up before we let you go, uh, when we were, before we went live, uh, we, we had you and the other guests, we were all kind of talking and you were talking a little bit about, you know, the success of the football team, you know, 
that all the national exposure and everything that they had, it kind of helped push the basketball team. Talk a little bit about, you know, there's a lot of schools that have maybe, um, you know, there's a one-off good basketball year or one-off this one. We're now talking about JMU. When you're recruiting to JMU, it's not recruiting to a sport, but an entire culture and athletic program that has shown national success across the board. Talk a little bit about that and your just perspective that you were, you and I were kind of talking about before the show today. So most definitely, um, I was just telling telling the guys uh, that are up on the podcast that, I mean, honestly, when you see your football team at nine and zero or eight, what was it, eight and zero before they lost, um, it's just like, oh my goodness, like they're top twenty five. Um, I mean, they weren't technically eligible for a bowl, but there was talks that they're they're getting a bowl, and um, I mean, it was just like at first it was like, man, they they set the, they set the bar for us. They set the tone. So just to come out after, and I mean, that game that we had against Michigan state, we, we built off the momentum, you know, had the double overtime game and then we come back and then it's college game day for football. So we play in Radford and that's the most people I've ever seen in the AUBC ever. So um, winning that game and then football had that beautiful day of, of just, you know, college game day and just celebrating the success over the past two years that they had built in the momentum. I feel like that just made us, work even harder to, you know, continue to to grow JMU, you know. Volleyball did a great job. I remember going to some of their games. And um, like I said, both soccer teams did amazing this year. So um, it's just – it's crazy, man. And, I mean, we're just going to continue to build on it. I feel like that's our new, our new you know, bar. It's, it's super high, and we're just going to continue to chase it. And I know football has been getting back after it for the spring season. I cannot wait to see them. Uh, two Saturdays from now and in their spring game. And I know they're going to bring the energy. And if you just watch all their Instagram reels and stuff like that, man, they get me super pumped up. I want to go out there and, and throw some pads <laughs> and a helmet on and play either wide receiver or DB or something like that. That'd yep. be super cool. But I mean, yeah, we, JMU is just a great place to be. And if you want to be great, you go to JMU. So, I mean, school has been great and I'm super, super, super excited to be back. And um, I'm getting back to work tomorrow. I kind of introduced my body to some workouts this week, but I'm I'm back in full full go this week coming up. So, yeah. Well, X, uh, listen, um, I, I'm incredibly excited that you're coming back. Uh, we talked a little bit about the show before, um, and I just think that you're going to be one of those JMU greats that uh, a lot of people remember not only watching, but what you've done off the court as well. And um, the, the outpouring of support for you when you, you announced that you were coming back was – um, I mean, something that I haven't seen for a lot of people. So the whole Jamie Nation is excited you're back. We're excited about the basketball team. We're excited about the new coach. Um, good things are in the future and, and glad that you're going to be one of the leaders on that team. Yes, sir. I appreciate you guys having me. Hope, hopefully I can get up here again soon. Uh, we will have you back as much as you want. So thank you for coming on tonight and uh, have a good night. Yes, sir. You do the same. All right. And with that, um, we're going to go from one great student athlete to another, uh, but we're going to switch over to football. And so with that, I'd like to introduce to the Sound Off audience, Jacob Dobbs, who is coming to us as a transfer from Holy Cross. I had the opportunity to meet Jacob at a basketball game uh, earlier this year. And uh, again, Jacob, one of my first impressions was uh, of you was I walked up to you you were kind of wide eyed and you were just looking around and you're like, this atmosphere is incredible. All the people are so incredible. The, the facilities are so incredible. I mean, you, you, you kind of seemed like a kid on Christmas day, just being like, this, this is too good to be true. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, there was this uh, viral video of you speaking to some recruits that were on campus talking about just how special JMU is to you. And uh, you'd only been here a few weeks. So, um, one, welcome to the, to the show tonight, but I kind of want to start there and just talk about um, talk about your journey from Holy Cross to JMU following Coach Chesney and where this uh, immense love for JMU so soon has come on has come from. Yeah, thanks for having me on tonight, Taylor. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here. And, you know, I had a pretty fortunate experience to follow JMU pretty closely because um, you guys are at the FCS level. So naturally, you know, we had – uh, some opportunities where there would be times where we could possibly see JMU in the playoffs. And, you know, they're a team you really didn't want to see because you're just they're so loaded. They do everything the right way. Just an unbelievable uh, football program. And then really, like, you know what a good movie looks like. You know what a bad movie looks like. But I don't know how to direct a movie. So the second I got here, I could just feel the energy and the atmosphere from the entire community, the buy-in from the students, the buy-in from the community of Harrisonburg, the alumni. I mean, it's just such a special place, and I can't say 
you know, enough nice things about Jamie. And it's an absolute blessing to be here. <laughs> We're glad to have you. No, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Jacob, thanks again for hopping on. Um, when we found out that, you know, when I reached out to you last week about hopping on the sound off, I was so excited because I know for myself and our listeners, we want to know what's going on in Jamie football. You know, Coach Chazzy's been on a tear, obviously coming in here, recruiting players, bringing on your coaching staff. Tell our listeners a little bit about what's been going on sort of behind the scenes with football. I think we had our first scrimmage on Saturday. Um, I listened to your interview with Corey Spector about some of the off-season conditioning, um, sort of separating the team into different groups just to build the chemistry. So for our listeners, like walk us through sort of like what the last few weeks have looked like since you've stepped on campus. Yeah, I mean, it's a grind. Uh, the coaches uh, went on the road recruiting right away because obviously they got to build the best roster possible. But uh, those first couple of weeks, you know, we were here just doing uh, lifts and runs with Coach Novak. And then when the coaches got back off the road, uh, we would do two uh, winter runs as a full team uh, every Monday and Wednesday morning. And so we split up into five different teams and they were D-U-K-E-S. You had a certain letter and it was just kind of like picking names out of a hat. Uh, so you get a bunch of different guys from different position groups that get to work together in these kind of competitive competitions uh, amongst each other on the team. It really helps build relationships outside of your position group and outside of your normal unit offense and defense. And it's a really cool thing that the coaches do because they really foster this brotherhood amongst the team, you know, not in just these position groups, but as a team as a whole. So you get to learn the offensive linemen, you get to learn the receivers, the running backs, guys that you might not normally interact with. And it's really cool to learn their stories, learn about them, because, you know, what makes a really good football team great is that brotherhood and that camaraderie. And you can't have that unless you truly know someone. And we had a lot of new faces. There was a little bit of turnover. But the guys who were here and have been here are just unbelievable people. And they know what the brotherhood and the standard is that is JMU football. And they did a great job of maintaining that and kind of, you know, uh, acclimating the new guys to that. So it's just been unbelievable, you know, to be here, work with the guys. We have a very hungry, competitive team. And you know, super excited. And then spring practice has been great so far. I mean, the practices are the best two hours of your day. That's the best way I can describe it. They're intense. They're, they're competitive. We have a lot, a lot of great competition, a lot of great depth, a lot of great people who just love playing football. So we get out there for those three hours. It's competitive. It's energetic, but we get a lot of great work done and we've done some great situational football so far. Awesome. I was going to say when, when we've stepped on and watched some of the practices, it's all been so much energy and tempo and everyone's running around and everyone's excited. Everyone's yelling, making a ton of noise um, for our listeners. Like, are there, is there maybe a player or two, maybe someone in the linebacker room that has kind of stood out or you're like, man, Jamie nation, let's keep an eye out on X, Y, and Z person. Is there someone that's really taken advantage of spring ball so far? Yeah, there's been a lot of guys who have done a lot of great things. I think the running back room in particular, we got a lot of guys who have made some great plays you know, so far just as a whole. And then the linebacker room, I think uh, Trent, who was here last year, got a little bit of playing time. I mean, he's emerged as one of the leaders on the defense. I can't say enough nice things about him because he's just such a good human being off the field. And then really seeing what he brings to the table every single day, just a relentless, you know, work ethic, always doing things the right way, always giving 100%. I mean, he's such a fun guy to play with. And, you know, all the other linebackers have done such a great job. We have such a great room at the linebacker position. And every single day when you go in there, one of those guys will put a smile on your face. And I think that's what's the most fun part about it. And uh, Coach Barber, our position coach, has you know, been phenomenal with us. He set you know, a very good standard and you know, helped the room uh, understand what our mission is and what our goals are. So really you know, can't say enough great things about you know, my position and where we're heading and all the other positions. Offensive line looks great, receivers looks great. I mean, really there's not a position that doesn't look great. And that's not just like, Oh, the preseason hype, like, of course, everybody looks great. Like it truly, you know, I feel really good about where we're at as a team. A lot of ways to go still. Obviously, there's more work to be done, but, you know, really proud of, you know, how the guys have been competitive and worked, you know, their butts off every single day. So let's talk a little bit on the bonding side. You, you mentioned, you know, how everybody's getting along and you're separated into teams, D-U-K-E-S. Just kind of give some insight on on how that happens. I mean, you're new. That you come in. I don't say you're new anymore because you've been here long enough not to be new. Um, but it's hard, you know, when you're coming from Holy Cross and the tradition it has, and it's such a great program. It's the one team I never wanted to face in the playoffs. So you weren't the only one watching. I'm like, good God Almighty, I don't want to play them. Let's play Monmouth. I um, was very happy to play Monmouth. I didn't want to play you. Um, Tell us how that works, because you've got guys that left. You know, you've got a bunch of guys that have come in. You guys have come in 
with Coach Chesney and his group. Just tell us, you know, I know the D DUK, you know, the Dukes team part of it. Just tell us about some of the other bonding and, and kind of how that's really gelling with you guys. Because I could tell yesterday, um, this is a pretty tight team and you're only seven practices in. So just kind of give us a little insight. Yeah, uh, the coach has done a great job of kind of uh, developing that brotherhood amongst us. But, uh, you know, really, they've done some really cool things for us. They got us uh, some games in the locker room. Like we have Connect Four in there. Uh, I know that uh, I've had some pretty good matchups. I don't think I've lost yet in Connect Four. Uh, I'm willing to bet that, uh, have everybody come at me if they'd like. But, uh, you know, just doing things like that, like outside of football, like obviously like on the field, we all love football. We love playing together. But really, you know, being in that locker room, you know, outside of football, like people don't feel obligated to be in that facility. Like we really love going in the weight room together, doing extra work, even just, you know, messing around in the training room, you know, while people are getting treatment or doing like extra work rehab type stuff. So it's just been, you know, an amazing experience to really gel as a team, you know, off the field and then hanging out with guys, you know, on the weekends outside, you know, of the football obligations has just been, you know, really cool to get to meet people, hang out with them and, you know, do some, you know, unique things that make a football team great because, you know, the stronger you are together, the better you're going to play in the field. And it's nice when it's not forced and you actually genuinely love the guys you're playing with. And that's what we have right now. So, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to uh, foster that, you know, through spring and then obviously in the summer and then fall camp. And I think, uh, you know, by the time September rolls around, we're going to be in a great spot, you know, in terms of brotherhood and camaraderie. Now, which team are you on, on the Dukes? I think we were K, yeah. K, K. So K. Is K leading the, the pack? Is, is, K, is K at the top? So K, unfortunately, did not win. Uh, I think I want to say uh, Cole Potts and I think Chauncey Logan, their team, I think they were team U. I might be misinformed on that because I'm not sure I remember, but I think they actually uh, came out as the Winter Warriors champions. Uh, their, their their team was phenomenal, though. I think they won probably 90% of the competitions. Uh, we Team K kind of snuck back in second or third place with some of the community service and the academic side of things. But, you know, Team U, I think, dominated tug of war. They dominated some of the plate hold stuff. You know, they were just kind of smoking people. So they, they earned that. But it was it's fun to do that in the winter because, you know, you're separated from position groups and you're not necessarily doing football things. You're actually doing hard lifting things, but somehow we're making them fun, which I think, you know, allows us to get, you know, some really good work at a really high level. Jacob, I, I realize this probably won't be a fair question to you because you're going to want to shout out every single person on the team. But, you know, you are a new face to the to the JMU football team. There are a lot of other new faces on the team. And I uh, was just wondering if you wanted to kind of maybe give a couple of shout outs to some of the new guys that are on the team for that, that fans will be excited to kind of uh, be on the lookout for. And again, like I said, I, I know that's probably half the team because, uh, you know, I, I'm excited that all of them are here, but just kind of you know, give some folks some names to be on the lookout for as we go into next football season. Yeah, I mean, I would say every single guy in the roster, but, you know, just some guys specifically. I think, uh, you know, Dylan Morris has done a phenomenal job at quarterback so far. They have a really good uh, quarterback competition going with all those guys in that room. But, you know, he's such a great human being. He comes from an obviously a great winning program in Washington. And, you know, he's been everything and more uh, for our program so far. Uh, Io in the running back room has been phenomenal. So has George and all those guys have done, you know, such a phenomenal job running the football. It makes my life really hard as a linebacker, so I don't appreciate it. But I'm glad that on Saturday I will be standing there watching them when they are on offense and they're going to be doing some, you know, really nice things uh, for our football team. Uh, the offensive line has been great. Uh, receivers, Cam Ross, just phenomenal human being from UConn. Uh, been great for us so far. He's made some great plays in practice uh, on the defensive side. You know, uh, Lloyd, who we brought in, has done a really good job. Ray is a, another great linebacker that I'm fortunate enough to work with every single day. And then, you know, really just all the guys. It, it's honestly just such a tight-knit team so far. And it's very surprising for how many new faces we have. But you, I got to give a lot of credit to the coaches, the way they structured the winter to really, you know, help us develop those relationships. And then we've taken as players and just, you know, continue to develop it forward. But it's been so much fun so far. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's truly really a testament, right, to Coach Chesney and the staff that he's brought on. Um, I've got a couple questions for you, Jacob. So I want well, let's nerd, nerd out a little bit about, like, X's and O's on the field. So when Coach Chesney announced he was coming to JMU, naturally I started saying, okay, let's, let's watch some Holy Cross videos. So I saw the Boston College game, I think, from a few years ago. I watched the, both South Dakota State games. Um, I've watched the Colgate games um, as well as a, as a few others. Seems like Holy Cross kind of plays that four-two-five sideline to sideline defense. Tell us a little bit about 
how much of that can we expect at JMU or maybe, maybe they've got a couple more wrinkles um, for this upcoming fall. Yeah. I mean, obviously uh, coach Chesney's flavor is going to be, you know, all over the defense, but uh, coach Hemphill who came over from Duke, uh, he's brilliant defensive mind. I love playing for that guy every single day. I mean, he's so intense, like him and coach Barber, you know, you line up brick walls in front of me. I'm ready to run through a million brick walls for those two guys right there. And really the whole, all the defensive coaches they brought in have been phenomenal, but uh, you know, there's going to be some things that, you know, we do that's, you know, coach Chesney, what he's done throughout his career, because he's obviously been very successful. And then I think coach Hempill has also, you know, had phenomenal success everywhere he's been as a coordinator. So really getting those two minds together, kind of marrying the two defensive systems, uh, like really our standard on defense is going to be all about, you know, maintaining good leverage and having really good matchups. So, you know, it's going to be kind of a flavor of the week thing for us. What does an offense do well? How can we stop it? And how can we get the offense off schedule and, you know, not allow them to dictate the game, but really bring it to them from a defensive side. So I'm very excited about that, you know, aspect of it, having Coach Chesney and Coach Hempel work together, you know, to uh, craft up a really, really cool defense. Awesome. Well, I, I've got a fun one for you. I was listening to one of your interviews, and it looked like it sounds like you played uh, some quarterback back in the day, right? Is that was that what you thought you were going to be growing up? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think my whole life I was going to be the quarterback to University of Michigan and play for the Detroit Lions as the quarterback. I have since ditched that little dream, <laughs> but uh, nobody's going to know who Tate Forcier is. But Tate Forcier was. A quarterback. He was at West Virginia. I remember him. Yeah, he was a, he was a quarterback for Rich Rod back in the day. He was number five, and he like he's the first college quarterback that like I watched. So I was actually number five growing up, and then I got to high school, and the first time I was on varsity, the only open number was twenty seven, and it happens to be my dad's number, so that's why I'm twenty seven now. But Tate Forcier was like the quarterback that I emulated. Probably you'd have a lot of people that are watching and have to Google him to even know who Tate Forcier is but he was a rich rod quarterback back in the day. Yeah. And that's who like I looked up to. And I, I thought I was going to be a spread option quarterback for Rich Rodriguez at Michigan. And, you know, obviously it didn't work out for him there. They brought in Brady Hoke and then Harbaugh. But, you know, I kind of gave up on that dream after about seventh grade, when I started to actually hit people. I'm like, okay, this defensive stuff's a lot more fun. Sure. <laughs> well, I was going to say, let, let's come back to that Tate Forcier bit in a second. I must ask, uh, you know, we watched a lot of tape last year, you know, we you had a quarterback named Matt Sluka just you know pounding the ball, running up the gut. Do you think uh, we'll see you behind center anytime soon for the Dukes? Listen, I tell Coach Kennedy and uh, uh, Coach Smith every single day, I'm like, listen, if you guys need a fullback, I'm your fullback. You guys need a Wildcat quarterback, I'm your Wildcat quarterback. Sorry, Demo. Sorry, the quarterback room. <laughs> I'm always politicking to try to, you know, maybe get a carrier or goal line package in. So uh, I've been asking for six years. I haven't got one yet. So – Really, the extent of my blocking ends up uh, usually on punt with a guy running full speed sure. out of Coach Kanan. So I got Coach Kanan's back. I tell him, listen, that's the, it's the closest I'll get to offense. So let me do whatever I can on punt for you, Coach. Hey, if I ever see you on the goal line with like a Tebow, uh, Tebow pop pass, I'll be, I'll be all for it. How about that? Just know they should let you come on the field and celebrate with me because if we speak that into existence, you, you deserve part of the celebration with me. <laughs> Well, let's go back to Tate Force, right? So thinking about it, I remember being younger playing like college football, NCAA, and I remember Tate Force in that rich rod, rich rod package, right? It was a lot of spread option, run the ball up the gut. Um, how excited are you at potentially sporting the JMU Purple with the NCAA game coming out, I believe, in July this year? Is the team excited about that? Oh, yeah, a lot of guys. I think the the, when that got dropped in the the group chat, uh, whenever that came out, I mean, I think we everybody on the team signed up within, you know, 30 seconds of that. Because, like, a lot of guys grew up, you know, playing the game. I still have NCAA 14. Uh, I used to be a guy that would download the live rosters, you know, for every I, I was the guy that updated all of the rosters every year. <laughs> yeah, I, listen, I would find someone's gamer tag on Reddit, be like, Notre Dame 35 has the live rosters for the 2019 season. I'm on there. I'm downloading the rosters, building the dynasty. That's Always awesome. start off at a small school. Now, like, now I can just win a national championship with uh, JMU because, you know, 12-team playoff. You don't even got to, like, do the small school to big school. I can do a six-year dynasty with JMU when it comes out in the fall might take away from some defensive study. So I'm not sure if Coach Hemphill and Coach Chesney will be happy about that, but I will have to delegate some of my time to NCA uh, 24 when that comes out because that is by far uh, my favorite game series ever. Love it. 
Well, to tell the folks in Michigan to get ready because that's where we're going when we get to the playoffs. We're going to the big house, and the App State win will be a distant memory. Um, they'll have to remember that JMU beat them in the playoffs in the first 12 team playoffs and then went on to uh, to beat Alabama next. That's where we're heading. So, yeah, I can dream. I, I could that would be a dream scenario for me. So, tell us what, what you like to do off the field. Um, you know, what's, what's going on with you in Harrisonburg? What kind of stuff do you like to do if you have time? I know. I know you don't have a ton of time, but what do you like to do when you're not doing football? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I really like to golf. I try to golf. Not very good at golf. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to feel good about their golf game, uh, they can invite me to go play golf with them. I'll give them a few good laughs, uh, hit a couple of bad shots, you know, have a good time with them. But, you know, I definitely – it relaxed me a little bit because I know I'm not good. So I just go out there hit the ball as hard as I can. It never really works out for me. Uh, you know, it always gets people to laugh because I'm so tight with my swing. My lats are like too big. So there's really not much rotation going on and stuff. Tyler Purdy's been trying to fix my swing for six years now. He hasn't done much for me, just laughs and hits a nice drive and kind of laughs at me as we're trying to walk up to his ball. But no, nah, that and uh, I like NCAA 14. And I still play it. I still have the 360. I actually don't have an Xbox One. I've held on to my 360 because – you know, that's the game I played since I was a little kid. So that's really uh, kind of my extent outside of the uh, football field. Nice. We'll get the quarterbacks to work with you. Usually um, quarterbacks are pretty good at playing golf. Um, yeah, I heard, Demo, have... I heard Demo's quite the golfer. So definitely yeah. going to have to go out with him after spring ball. Yeah, those, those guys usually have more. They don't take as many hits. So it's it's a little easier for them to be able to swing and get those hips rotated. So um, yeah, especially let me ask you. One, they got this. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. So yeah. they're usually really good. Tony Romo, if you look at all those guys playing celebrity golf, it's usually the hockey players and the and the, and the quarterbacks in the NFL. Um, tell, I got one more question for you. Tell us what your least favorite thing is about practice and your favorite um, thing about practice. I honestly can't say I don't have a least favorite thing about practice. Maybe the ending. Like, that's honestly the true answer because, like, it's actually so much fun, you know, to be out there with those guys all the time. Uh, and my favorite thing about practice is probably inside run. Um, yeah, that's the most linebacker answer ever because there's no pass plays. There's only offensive line, D line and linebackers, and it's always a run play. So that's kind of that old school football where it's just ground and pound downhill. So definitely inside runs my favorite period. And if I had to pick one period that I don't like, like stretch, I mean, cause you're not playing football. That's the only part of practice. You're not playing football. So if I had to pick one period of practice that I don't, thoroughly love it would be stretch but i can't say that i hate stretch so really you know the ending of practice is the only thing that's disappointing me that's the god's honest truth i said it before we started this episode about if you could you know create a player and, and, and instill everything not just on the field but all the off the field and the mentality and the love for jmu i mean you you and x are, are two guys that just i mean you 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 resonate all of that so um, I did want to wrap up real quick. A couple of weeks from now, uh, we got a spring game coming up. I know Coach Chesney and the JMU staff are talking about, you know, really wanting to make this a fun game and make it a game environment. So for those people that might be on the fence and they're thinking, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to come to Harrisonburg. I'm thinking about it. Some of my friends trying to get me. Uh, give a little pitch to those who are listening why they need to be in Harrisonburg in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, really, you just uh, want to see, you know, the next generation and next uh, great team that is going to be uh, JMU football. And I know they got the raffle where people can call plays and stuff. I highly recommend doing that. And I highly recommend blitzing every single play if you have the luxury of winning that. But uh, we've worked really hard throughout the winter and throughout the uh, the spring so far to uh, make JMU football as great as it possibly can be. And, you know, I know those guys in the locker room every single day are trying to uphold the championship standard that was set before by so many great JMU football players. So really, you know, to the fans out there, if we can get, you know, as many people out at the spring game as possible and make this a game environment for all those who might not have had a chance to play in the past and for all the new guys coming in, uh, we greatly appreciate, you know, seeing you guys support us uh, for our first time uh, wearing a JMU uniform. I mean, and I got to hype up, you know, the, the Mount Player Collective is doing the uh, coach for the day opportunity. And I, and I, I, I haven't looked at the, the, the details and everything, but I think that could potentially include lining up Jacob Dobbs behind center. I mean, if it's if you get to be the coach for the day, no one can tell you no. Am I right? Yeah. Blitz, Bama, Blitz. Just as Real Tide really <laughs> says, like, Blitz, Bull, Blitz, JMU, Blitz. Let's do it. Like, come on. 
For those of you watching on Facebook or watching this archive, uh, we've got the Montpelier link uh, down below in the comments, but also you can just go to Montpelier montpelliercollective.com and check out the information there for Coach for a Day. Let's sell the place out, bring the streamers, set up your tailgate. Let's make this a game day in Harrisonburg, uh, just like the fall. And like Jacob said, this is a great opportunity to see the next generation of JMU Dukes uh, that are going to go out there and continue to make national waves uh, like JMU has. So, Jacob, man, thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Go Dukes. Go Dukes. All right. And with that, um, now we're going to bring on uh, a familiar voice, familiar face and a familiar voice that all of you know. Voice of the Dukes, Dave Rigert, is going to come on. And uh, Dave, you know, one reason we wanted you to come on was there's been so much going on with the wrap up of basketball season. We can only touch on so much with X. We also got a lot of stuff going on with football outside of what Jacob was talking about. So we really was kind of wanting to kick it with you a bit and just talk everything that didn't get talked about just now with, with X and Jacob. And um, I'll start things off. I want to talk basketball because uh, there is a video that I kind of feel is going to be one of these videos. Yep. You know what I'm talking about? And I don't know if this was your idea or Matt Costner or, or who did this, but the video of you calling the end of that Wisconsin game. And there's two things about that video that stood out to me. One that you were at that moment making a historic call that is likely going to be, you know, in B-roll footage and stuff for years to come because it was a big moment for Jamie basketball. But two, the other thing that kind of stuck out to me was you were excited, but there was still kind of this calm and composure because <laughs> at the end of the day, we had been up by 10 points the whole game. So it wasn't like a buzzer beater or a come from behind win. It was kind of just like, yeah, we did it. And we've done it for the last 40 minutes. So um, talk a little bit about your experience calling the game uh, in Brooklyn for the Dukes. Well, James Gutchow is um, he, he's the main video guy and he handled the basketball side gotcha. of things. And he um, he came to me before and he goes, you don't have your GoPro with you, do you? And I go, I don't. He goes, I was going to bring it and going to have it on you because they actually had it on me for the bowl game. Unfortunately, I didn't really get to use much of that because of what happened in the bowl game. So um, this is something that we're talking about doing a little bit more often. And, and so we didn't have a GoPro at the time for the game. Uh, with about four minutes left, it was pretty evident that, that the Dukes were going to win that basketball game with how they were playing and what was going on. And James sent Chris Brooks and I a text and he goes, Hey, set up your phone and just start recording because we need this. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah. so we were, at the, I think the under four timeout and I, I set it up real quick and um, it, it ended up working out. Okay. I just kind of set it up quick, put it in front of me and I just started calling the game again, but uh, it worked out pretty well. But yeah, it was like X was talking about earlier. It was such an unbelievable ride in Brooklyn. Um, this was such a special team. We, we talked so much about how teams are connected and together. And this, this team was, was one of the, the most special teams that I've been around. And to have them ha have the fruits of their labor pay off in an NCAA tournament win and a dominant win against Wisconsin, just the whole, the whole weekend was magical. I know the, the loss to Duke, it sucked, but, you know, it was what it was. They shot lights out and not, no one would have beat that team on that day. But to get there and even the, the, the open practice on Thursday, to just walk into Barclays and look around and see everything, um, see the March Madness logo at midcourt, um, the, the, the first, I mean, just everything about the floor and just the arena, how they treated this, the team and, and all of us involved. It was, a, it was a special, special moment. And for those guys, again, a lot of those guys talked about how it's a dream come true for them to play in the tournament. It was a dream come true for me to call a game in the tournament. It really was. That's something that I've always wanted to do. That, that, that's, I can check that now off the bucket list because I wanted to call a March Madness basketball game. I had never done it at the Division One level, and the Dukes obviously hadn't been there in 11 years. But to get there and just be a part of it and get a win like that, um, it was so special. Such a fun weekend. <laughs> Dave, I've always enjoyed your ability to sort of capture like the, the spirit of JMU Nation or like the spirit of – maybe what we're interested in listening to at the time. So if anyone doesn't listen to like ESPN radio, Dave just does a great job because I remember when you dropped like uh, the coach D Mike interview a couple of days ago and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. We got the recruiting coordinator on. Um, and then you had like some of the players on it. I mean, you just do a phenomenal job and I try to make sure I retweet that out just so everyone can listen in. Um, but I really love that you were able to get coach P on the line like ASAP and listening to his story and just be able to talk a lot about, you know, coming out of Kentucky, going to Moorhead and experiencing sort of JMU after that. 
tell us a little bit about like your thoughts on the hire uh, for Jamie basketball. I know you had some former colleagues that used to work with him, I believe um, back in your home state. I, if, if I get the facts correct. So love to kind of hear your initial thoughts with coach P. First of all, it was a home run hire. He is unbelievable. I got a chance to talk to him quite a few times last week, and there's a meet and greet with him tomorrow at O'Neill's at 5 o'clock that if folks are in Harrisburg, go meet Coach P because he is unbelievable. Um, Jeff Bourne and, and the search committee did a wonderful job. And, you know, when when I first saw the hire, um, when, when his name started coming up, then I obviously started looking into to Coach Spradlin and, and thought that it would be a, certainly a good hire. But he's blown away my expectations of what, what I thought this hire would be. You mentioned the interview that I had. So he did the Zoom press conference as an introductory press conference on Tuesday. Well, I got a text about 30 minutes after the Zoom was over saying, hey, do you want an interview with, with Coach Spradlin? He wants to keep this momentum going and he'll give you as much time as you need. And, and again, think about what he's got going on. He's, he's got all of this happening, but he's on vacation with his family. So he's making time and wanting to do this. I've never had a coach reach out and say, hey, does Dave want an interview with me? It's always me searching it, and, and they're usually willing to do it. And, and I was going to reach out and try and get one, but he's the one that brought it to me. So I think that says a lot about what he wants, what he's going to do with this program. We've seen it with Coach Chesney. He's much more out in the public, much, again, just a different personality that that is trying to, to get people – to, to come to this program, not hoping that they're going to come to the program. I think coach Spradlin's the exact, the exact same way. So um, I have been blown away by, by everything that I've heard um, getting a chance to talk to him. He's been very personable. Um, he, he gave me 40 minutes on the air and we talked for about 10 or 15 minutes off the air, just um, getting to know each other a little bit. And, and so again, in the role that I'm in, we get to talk to these players and coaches so much and really have a pretty deep relationship. So to be able to start that way and for him to be able to give time, to me to do that was unbelievable. And when he got hired that Friday, uh, the news broke around, it was during my show actually that it broke. I got two text messages um, and three total, two text messages right away. And I was at Missouri Western uh, division two school, just in, in, just outside of Kansas city in St. Joe, Missouri, before I came to sit to uh, JMU and the head basketball coach at Missouri Western is Will Martin. And then his assistant coach is John hood. Well, John hood played at Kentucky when coach Spradlin was there at UK and then Will Martin was a team manager while Coach Spradlin was there, too. So they know him very well. They were, they were in the back rooms breaking film down and doing whatever they were told to do because, again, they were on the low end of the totem pole. And the first text messages I got were from those two. And Coach Martin, the head coach at Missouri Western, said, you are going, that's my guy, and you are going to absolutely love working with him, and he will do a phenomenal job. And Coach Hood sent me one about 10 minutes later saying he's the most – um, loyal, honest, trustworthy human being, not just coach that you're ever going to find. And he will be a, a, just a blessing to James Madison. And that's what I've heard too. And then there was an athletic director that was at Missouri Western as well. That's in the OVC. And that, that's where Moorhead state was from. He was at UT, he's at UT Martin, Kurt McGuffin is his name. And he said, you guys got a good one. Um, <laughs> and I think that was as simple as the text was, you guys got a good one with coach Spradlin, but um, he's been unbelievable so far. X nailed it on the head that he has exceeded expectations. You can read so much about someone, then you can meet them. And it is an absolute home run hire that uh, Jeff Bourne and the search committee made. Well, ho hopefully now that the coach Cal, he has the relationship with Calipari. I would hope that Kentucky would give us two games at the AUVC and we'll give you <laughs> one at Rupp Arena. Yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> it'd be great to have, uh, have that happen. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about his, uh, the interview you did with him is fantastic. So for folks that don't follow Dave, you're, you're missing something. That was about a 40 minute interview and all 40 minutes of it were unbelievably good. And he talked about something in there that I wanted to follow up with you. And I didn't know if you have asked him any more about it or if you've talked to the guy, he mentioned he's got a character coach. Um, and I love that. So if you guys haven't listened to the interview, I'm, I'm going to spoil part of it, but you still need to listen to it. Um, on the character coach part is, is he here yet? Has he, has he in Harrisonburg yet? And if not, you know, when's he coming? Cause that, that fascinates me that he has somebody on staff to check him on how he's dealing with players, how he's dealing with the media, how he's dealing with officials just kind of give folks a little bit of insight into that, if you would. But it, it was pretty interesting, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's something that um, in this day and age of, of mental health and everything like that, um, to have a character coach on his staff, they, for folks who don't know, and this is, again, part of the interview, but he has a character coach on his staff. And I don't know if he is going to, to be here. I would guess that he will be, but, um, again, that we don't know that yet. 
But and I'm not sure he was even employed by the university or how that all worked. But nonetheless, he had a character coach when he was at Moorhead State for a long time. And one of the examples he gave is that he's there to help the team and to help him. But he would be in and all the huddles and and see what Coach Spradlin was doing in a huddle. And they talk again away from everyone, kind of about how he wants to act with the team or what he needs to say or kind of the emotions that he needs um, to, to relay to his team to kind of stay in the moment. And after huddles and stuff, the character coach is in there. He's kind of reading the situation, reading how players are reacting to Coach Spradlin and, and how Coach Spradlin is, is in a certain moment. And then after the game and, and the next day or whatever, they meet and talk about it and they go over kind of the notes that, that they find out. And, and one of the things that, that he brought up was in, in a timeout last year, you know, he was talking and going through everything. And um, the character coach said the next day that, hey, you, you want to you be a certain way but you were acting like this or telling them this. And, and that's not, that's not kind of the way that we're trying to go about how you're, you're trying to reach this team or whatever. So um, there's somebody kind of coaching him on, on, on how he reacts to certain situations and just making him aware of those. Cause those are things that you don't see very often, but it, it's pretty fascinating that again, he, and he goes into detail about how early in his career he was, he was a young coach made a bunch of mistakes, but he's growing and learning and continuing to do that. And, Again, last four years at Moorhead, he was unbelievable. And I think that's a big reason why, that, that he's open and honest about a lot of different things. And he has people that are around him at all times to make him the best that he can be and, and make sure that they're, in, they're on the, the right path, the same path and the path that they want to be on, that they don't veer off that very far. That was unbelievable. I mean, I, I, it would be great for me to have a character coach in my law firm, <laughs> for me. <laughs> I'm not you might so need sure to. That, I might need to. That, that poor person would really <laughs> probably quit day one. But I'll, I'll turn this back over to Taylor and let him ask some questions. Well, uh, I want to echo what Steve said, first of all. For anyone that's listening to us and is not listening to these interviews that Dave's doing, um, I mean, you, you have some of the first access to players, coaches. You have a lot of time just to sit down. So if you're a JMU fan that wants the inside scoop on all things, players, personnel, coaches, uh, make sure you're following Dave. Would you say – uh, Twitter X is probably the best place to catch a lot yeah. of these interviews. Yeah, um, yeah, that's where I'll, I'll post them always there. Um, there's an ESPN Harrisonburg SoundCloud site as well, so um, those are the easiest places. But it, 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 I know we're going to get into football, but I did a live show on Thursday after uh, after the practice um, at Bridgeforth, and it was unbelievable. I got Coach Chesney, Jacob. Obviously, you heard him, and he was phenomenal. I had Dylan Morris on the first time we've had a quarterback in the spring in a few years, and, and then um, also I had Tyreek Tucker, and those. It's so much different because a lot of the times I'll just be on the field with them for five minutes. And it, it's so hard that they just finished practice. Uh, they were just wrapping up and they, they don't want to be there a lot. And there's other media that's doing stuff as well. But I, it was about, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes after practice. They were able to shower, kind of relax. We're sitting down, just kind of relax. And you can get so much good information from these guys. And Coach Chesney was all about it. He, he Again, he'll, he'll grant me as much access, I think, as I want, which is unbelievable. So um, those were some of the ones. But, yeah, we're going to – eventually throughout the spring, we're getting all the assistant coaches on. And those have taken off. Sam Daniels was really good last week. He was, he was great talking about uh, the practices and being back at JMU. You guys talked about Coach DeMichael, and, and he was phenomenal. So I love this coaching staff. I, I haven't got – I'm going to have a chance this week to talk to the, the new men's basketball coaching staff and get those guys on the air. So those are some interviews that are coming. But all the assistants for football, um, I love the football staff they put together. It is incredible. And I think this basketball staff, they have got a lot of continuity. So, um, again, these are home run hires with tremendous assistant coaches coming in as well. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Michael uh, – tra- uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm going to let Michael take over the football stuff because I have one more <laughs> basketball question that I do want to ask you. And it's about up in Brooklyn um, with, you know, some of the media tweets, people that weren't as familiar with JMU were just talking about – man, this crowd and the people and, you know, this team. And, and, and um, I was curious, did you have a chance to talk to any other media people there and, and get their feedback on JMU? And also, did you get to have a chance to talk to the CBS play-by-play guys um, and get some insight on their uh, perspective of JMU? I did talk to Ian Eagle uh, for quite a while um, after the Wisconsin game. So it was before the, the Duke game um, on Sunday. And um, he was he was gracious enough. He came over and was talking to me and just talking all JMU and, and um, just talking about obviously being blessed to, to have the job that I have right now going, what, 43 and, and six in the uh, in the um, 
two two sports that I cover primarily with football and basketball. But um, he was over overwhelmed with how loud it was in there. Um, there were some other media members there from from Fox and some others, um, and they were blown away by by what this was. And I, I saw people on 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 X even talking about you know um, it, it shouldn't shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And then they put pictures of college game day and the record crowd there. So JMU nation shows out. Um, obviously our, our fans are fanatics. There, there's no doubt about that, but a lot of the, a lot of the media members, the national media members um, were blown away. And I think obviously me and the other local media members were blown away, but we understand it. We get it. We, we, we see it all the time. So we're not surprised by it, but the national media folks, there was a lot of buzz about that um, on Sunday before the, the Duke game. Cause it was the first game of the day. And they were still talking about, Man, it was uh, it was it was like Harrisonburg up in, in the Barclays Center. So <laughs> there was a lot of people that were very impressed by JMU Nation that they showed out like they did. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, Silver, I, I, I have a little bit of FOMO when I, I decided not to make it up. I think that Friday to the Barclays, <laughs> just from Virginia, but uh, it looked phenomenal. We heard we heard, we were hearing the JMU chants on the TV broadcast. I had to um, turn my crowd surreal. mic all the way down because the JMU crowds were right behind me when I was courtside at the Barclays Center. And it was so loud. I felt like I was getting drowned out by the JMU wow. crowd, which is great. So I turned my crowd mic all the way off because it was coming through my, my mic as, as much as it was. So That's amazing. I mean, people don't <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, yeah, like, you know, they, they talk about these small schools. I see these graphs all the time with small schools and such. I'm like, Jamie's got 23, 24,000 students. They've been well over 20,000 students for many years now. So we have alum everywhere. And to your point, right, we're all fanatics. That's why we're doing the podcast. That's why we are we are. Um, I, I love it. So switching to football a little bit, um, I'm not sure how much you could speak to this, but one thing I really noticed from Coach Chesney's staff is, number one, I've never seen so many more, so much support staff in a JMU coaching um, staff before, which is amazing. Number two, I've noticed he's been able to bring in some of his Holy Cross position coaches in as analysts. I think Coach Z on the O-line, Coach Barnes, um, and he recently just brought Coach Chris Smith, who I think was in the Giants for a year, but he was like the OC and the O-line coach at Holy Cross. Um, tell us, if you can, like the impact on some of the, the quality of coaches he's been able to bring in, and more importantly, like the volume of coaches as well. I feel like they're, I haven't seen so many coaches running around as, as ever before. A lot of analysts, and, and you hit the nail on the head, there's position coaches that are analysts uh, that don't have a specific spe uh, specific position, but they can work with whoever they need to work with and do different things. So to have position coaches um, from the previous stop at Holy Cross to now be able to kind of oversee things and, and kind of dive into different things, um, this is the biggest step that I've seen here in my, in my time. And obviously, um, I've just been here when Coach Signetti was here, but they've added a lot of different pieces. And, and I thought Coach Z may, may slide in when Coach Robo left for Maryland, that he may slide in because he was the offensive line coach at Holy Cross. But instead, he stays in that position. They bring in Chris Smith who was the offensive coordinator with Coach Chesney at Holy Cross. And then he went to the Giants for a year. Um, so they just keep bringing in great coaches. And Coach Chesney is so well-connected. Um, and he brings in – I'll tell you what, this coaching staff is really unbelievable. They have, they're just great guys. Um, I think they're really good coaches. But, but they say hi to me as they're run, running by with their position um, and, and just doing different drills. And I think he has brought in a high-quality staff, really, really good young coaches that are so energetic. And – you know, when I was talking with Sam Daniels earlier this week, he go. I was asking him about practice and if he's seen anything like this because it is night and day from what they did before. It is. It, it's night and day. It's it's so fast paced. It's up tempo. There's no standing around. Um, they are flying around. They've got two different groups going at times when, when they're going seven on seven, and that was never the case before. And Sam Daniels, who is the defensive line coach, and, and back at Jam, you said he has never seen anything like this. So I think that speaks volumes to to have another coach that's been to a lot of different places. Again, he's made five or six stops before getting back to Harrisonburg and being at JMU. And he says he's never seen anything like this. I think that speaks to, to kind of what they're doing. And I think it's cutting edge stuff. I don't think a lot of teams are doing this. They use a lot of analytics and they really break things down. And I think that's why they have analysts. And that's why this staff is so big because they break everything down so well and, and they try and be cutting edge on everything. Coach Chesney said it during his introductory press conference that he's gone to NFL practices because that's what he wants to be like. And I think that's what he's doing right now. The practices are, are so fun to watch. And nothing is the previous step because they won and they did, it, they did it the right way. It was just different. It was just different than what they're doing right now. And there's different ways to win football games. We know that. Coach Signetti was very successful 
in the way that he did it. It's just a different way to do it. It's, but one thing it's done is energize this program. It's energized the players. Um, they have competitive periods, at least for every practice. And sometimes fights break out and they did last week just because they are, they are fighting and, and being competitive every single play of every single practice. It's, it's so much fun to watch. And, and you guys have seen it firsthand, um, but it's been pretty unbelievable. Yeah. I do love like some of the good on good competitive periods, I think between some of the team pieces, I know we asked Jacob Dobbs a very similar question earlier, but like, is there a person or a player or two that has stood out for you when you've been going to practice that you're like, man, I think that could, that person could be a difference maker on the field. Io Adeyi will be a first team, all Sunbelt running back. He is flashing every single practice. Uh, he's the transfer from North Texas um, he is really, really good. Uh, he flashes every single day. Um, he's built like a running back. He looks like a running back. He has breakaway speed. He's shifty. Um, he sees the field so well. I've been able to stand behind the offense during some practices and, and just be able to see him cut and make different moves. Um, but he is one that I think really stands out. I think he is going to be an exceptional addition to this football team and they're going to run the ball. Um, Jacob talked about that running back room, but Solomon Van Horse, he looks really healthy right now. Um, Wayne Knight, again, he, he went to the transfer portal, but decided to come back and stay with his brother. And, and he's getting a lot of reps right now. I think, I think they've got a lot of guys. George Petaway came in from North Carolina, um, but Tyler Purdy is a guy that he was, he's kind of a Jack of all trades and, and I'll be interested to see how they use him, but they've got a lot of different guys that they can use the running back spot. And I think they're going to throw the ball to those guys a lot and IO can catch the football. So I think he is going to be electric. I think he is going to be really, really good. So, and, and the offensive line is, is going to be really good because they've got so many guys up front, so much experience. That'll be the strength of that offense. So they should be able to run the football, but, and then I, I think honestly, Dylan Moore, um, you you want to see a guy step in and kind of command the football team. We didn't see that from Jordan McLeod in the spring last year. We didn't. But we do see it right now from, from Dylan Morris. Um, I think it's going to be hard for him not to win the job. It's an open competition. It is. And, and he's not going to name a starter. Coach won't until the fall. And, and he may not <laughs> until the first game. Um, but it's Dylan Morris's job to lose. And he's been very impressive. He's such a smart kid. Um, it's such a a contrast because JC Evans is already on campus, the freshman from Florida, um, from Miami. He's a big, tall, stud looking athlete, but you can looks tell. like a tall defensive end out there. Like he's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you can tell he should still be in high school. Probably. I'm, I'm glad he's here and getting the reps, but when Dylan Morris goes and then JC Evans goes, there's quite the difference. And there should be, that there should be a difference because he, again, he's been in school for five years and, and JC Evans should be in high school right now, going to his prom here in a couple of weeks, something like that. But he's on campus and there are some other high school kids that are on campus that graduated early, but everything seems slower to Dylan Morris. Um, he processes everything very fast and he's making the right reads. He's made a couple of really good throws in the scrimmage in some of the scrimmage things that they've had so far. So those two on offense have really stood out. Um, Honestly, you asked Jacob this, but I'm going to say Jacob Dobbs. He is a freaking stud, fellas. He is really, really good. Um, he is a leader on this team. He might be the leader on this team. This might be his team right now. When I see him at practice, he is leading the stretches a lot. And Dylan Morris was leading the stretches a lot. I haven't seen a quarterback lead the stretches for a while and, and get him going. Dylan Morris was doing that. But Jacob Dobbs, the first day of practice, his voice is everywhere. And it's, sometimes it's hard for someone to come in and do that in their – only year here and they've been somewhere else but I think he's comfortable because of the work he put in in winter conditioning uh, I think he has earned the respect of everyone else and his numbers speak for themselves and in this day and age when they found out Jacob Dobbs was coming you know all the guys that were here were looking at his stats and seeing what he did and his accomplishments and and that's respect right there because of what he's done in his career but he's earned that respect and he is the leader of that defense right now and he mentioned Trent Hendrick I think he's been impressive um and one guy we were talking off the air about Emmanuel Bush and he and Tyreek Tucker they're different players right now those are two guys they need at the defensive tackle spot and Emmanuel Bush and Tyreek both started to flash at the end of last year but those are guys that are returning players that need to step in and fill the, the shoes of Jamry Chroma and, 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 and Carpenter and those guys. They've got to be big-time players. But Emmanuel Bush, he is vocal. He is getting after the offense. He's always talking trash. I didn't see that one time last year. And he's kind of coming into his own. And Tyreek's always going to talk. that. <laughs> he's a tucker. He, he's always going to talk. 
Um, but those two guys have stepped up on the defensive line. But again, and, and then they've got the, the veterans back in the secondary with uh, Jacob Thomas playing really well. The corners are back. So uh, I really like what this defense is doing right now. And a coach Hemphill, Jacob mentioned this earlier, but he is a brilliant defensive mind. They've got great, a great coaching staff on both sides. But those are some of the guys that have flashed. But Jacob Dobbs, he couldn't speak for himself. I can. He's a freaking stud. Yeah. I mean, that's your Sun Belt Defensive Player of the Year right now. I can yeah, tell you that. Um, yeah. that he's unbelievable. It, the, the fact that he carries himself, I haven't seen a player um, like him in a long time. We've had a lot of great players go through here. But I haven't seen a player like him in terms of – it feels like he's been at JMU for five years. Um, it does, yeah. Because he's and absorbed. He's, taken the his, he, he's absorbed the history. You're, you're exactly right. He, he has looked into – former players and what this what this program is all about and you know he, he talks about you know I, I knew of JMU well you know about the program when you're in the FCS and playing like he did at Holy Cross but you don't know it like he does now as soon as he got here he dove into the history of this program and knows a lot of the players and he's talked about that with me but he, he is dove in head first and he is he's all JMU right now it does feel like he's been here toddy from a couple of years ago and different players that are here for a year Boy, you wish you had him for three or four because how good would they have been in, in purple and gold? But but those are the guys that are good because they dive in and they they respect what has happened in the past and they they want to they want to continue what the past players have done because they they jumped right in and, and they've dove right into that past and, and really embraced everything. Yeah, I've got to get Justin Riscotti to call him because this reminds me a lot of when Riscotti came on campus and how this team became Justin's really quickly. Um, and how that the team did miss a beat. And that was the key to the 2004 championship run. And, and also Lazat letting him do it. What, that, that's all history stuff. Let me ask you a question about access. And tell, talk, talk to us a little bit about, is the access different um, with this coaching staff, with players and so forth? Are you getting different access? Are you getting more access? Is it Just, just tell us a little bit about that. A lot more access right now. Um, we had four players of available to the media on a Thursday after practice um, in my time here. And, and I, I know time before that, cause talking to Chris Brooks who handles um, all the, the communications for football. Um, he doesn't know the last time there's been four players available for during a practice to media, whether that be spring or fall or whenever. Um, and and they they were willing to come on with a live show with me after that. So the access has been, um, it, it's just different. I, I think coach Chesney just, just views it differently. And, and I think he, I don't know if trust is the right word, but he just allows his assistant coaches, his players to maybe speak more. And, and, and Coach Signetti, again, he's an old school coach, and he came from the Nick Saban tree where it's kind of one voice for the team, and, and that was Coach Signetti. And that's why I was the only one to be able to interview the coordinators or any assistant coaches ever. And I interviewed the coordinators for my pregame show every every week um, during the season. Um, and then I'd get him in the off season once in a while, but no one else got him. I mean, he, it was one voice and it was coach Signetti's voice and that's what he learned. And that's, that's what worked for him. And obviously that that's been successful. It's just different now. Um, coach Signetti, um, certain or coach uh, Chesney certainly believes in his assistant coaches and their voice and, and wants them to be heard. And I think he wants them to develop because they probably want to be head coaches at some point in time. They're going to have to deal with the media and do press conferences. And uh, he wants them to, to, again, deal with that and do that. So the access has been – there's just been a lot more. It's as simple as that. Um, he's, he's allowing more players to talk. He's allowing – again, and this was Coach Signetti. Um, it, it, we didn't talk to Todd Santeo in the spring when he came in. We didn't talk to Todd Santeo in the fall before the game started. The first time we talked to Todd Santeo was after his first game as a Duke. We didn't talk to Jordan McLeod last spring. We didn't talk to Jordan McLeod in the fall before the first game. The only reason we talked to Jordan McLeod for the first game is because he came in and was good in the second half when he wasn't named the starter but came in. So the first time we talked to the starting quarterback of the Dukes was after game one each of the last two years. So, again, we, we talked to Dylan Morris on Thursday. He was live on my show. We got to know him as a person, not just a player. Um, so the access is just a lot different than it used to be. Well, Dave, um, again, thank you so much for coming on. You've probably been one of the – I think you are the top recurring guests because you're one of the most requested of, uh, of our <laughs> listeners and everything. And you, you just have an, an insight and combined with a passion for this program on all the sports you cover that really is unmatched, and that includes the three of us. Uh, so uh, really do appreciate you coming on. I do want to wrap with uh, kind of the same question that I asked, uh, I asked Jacob. we got the spring game coming up in a couple weeks. If there's some people on the fence that are thinking about 
you know, do I really want to make the drive up to Harrisonburg? Again, wrap it up and tell, give, give the pitch for why Jamie fans need to come out to Bridgeforth uh, in two weeks. It's a new era of Jamie football, and it's, it's a special era of Jamie football. I think this, is, this program obviously is at, our, at an all-time high right now, but Coach Chesney and his coaching staff, they are the right people to continue um, the upward trajectory of this program. And again, now with, with – there's no limitations, ladies and gentlemen. There's no limitations. Jamie, you can go win a Sun Belt championship without having to beg and plead and try and get into that title game. They can go be in the 12-team playoff that's available now um, for a group of five teams. So this is a team that can do that. They would have had an opportunity each of the last two years to be able to do that had there not been any restrictions. Um, now there aren't any restrictions. And this coaching staff is doing something, like I said, they're, they're, they're cutting edge on some of the things that they're doing in practice. And they're bringing the right guys in. All the guys that I talk about, you guys talk about my interviews and all these guys that I talk about, they're unbelievable human beings. You could see that from X and, and, and Jacob Dobbs tonight. These guys are unbelievable human beings. Get to know this team, however it is. Again, we've got more access for all of our fans to get to know all these players. Um, so then maybe, again, there might be some support where, hey, I, I heard this interview. I heard this podcast or whatever it is. And, boy, I really like that kid. I, I, maybe it, it makes a fan want to go watch the game now instead of just kind of pay attention, look at scores and everything like that, get to know these players in this day and age of football and basketball in any sport. There's so much, so much change every single year in roster turnover. And, and sometimes I know fans get frustrated because we, a player used to be there for three or four years. We knew who they were. We'll get to know them right now because even though Jacob Dodds is a one-year guy, just like Todd Santeo and others, we're going to think of him as a JMU great yep. of all time because of what what they've done and that that's it, it's coach chesney's doing this the right way and with that he's doing the spring game the right way it was a glorified scrimmage before and so many programs do that it wasn't just coach signetti and his staff so many programs do that but the marching royal dukes are going to be at the spring game there's going to be other things at the spring game that are game like i think he's going to make this fun and entertaining and game like he gets it with the fan base that they want to be entertained they don't want to just see 40 plays and, and here we go. There's nothing else going on. He's going to make this entertaining. He wants the marching Royal Dukes to be there and, and others. So get out to bridge for, see this new era, see it for yourself. You can hear me talk about it all you want and I can make it sound great, which it is go see it for yourself. And you can see firsthand what this program is all about in this new era of JMU football. Well, thank you, Dave, so much again. And I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Hope to have you gone again soon. Gentlemen, anytime. Always a pleasure. All right. And with that, uh, we're going to go around the horn real quick. Some final thoughts. Um, I'll kick it off. I, I just want to say uh, I had a buddy of mine, Mike Davis. He's watching. He's a, he's a Tennessee alum. We grew up in Virginia Beach together. And uh, he texted me after he saw us sweep App State uh, earlier today. And he said, and this was, again, unsolicited. We don't really talk that much. But he said, man, this is pretty incredible, the year that JMU's having. He goes, all your teams continue to be in the national headlines. He goes, and I wouldn't be surprised to see you guys make a run in the NCAA tournament for, for baseball. Again, we've talked about softball. Uh, we've talked about lacrosse. Um, this is going – we are wrapping up what is going to be a JMU athletic season that we can't take for granted. And then we have the excitement of all these new coaching staffs that uh, X and Jacob talked about. And, um, you know, we still got some uh, some more excitement to, to close this chapter with the hiring of a new athletic director here in a few months or – even a few weeks, we don't really know. Um, but having said that, um, I'm just really excited for what these next couple of weeks, the next couple of months to wrap up this spring sports season, including spring football and kind of the preview that that's going to show for the fall. Um, I couldn't be more excited to be a JMU fan right now. And uh, I don't have much more to say other than that. And I'll kick it to Michael. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, you know, we've seen it multiple years with football, just with the success in the last decade. But now with basketball, being able to hire from a position of strength, right? I think Lewis Rowe was a Bowling Green assistant, maybe. And I think Coach Byington was at Georgia Southern for a few years. And then we look at Coach P's resume. Like, I mean, he was in the NCAA tournament. I think two out of the five years or six years he was at Moorhead and winning multiple championships. And you say the same thing about who's the new AD going to be? Hiring from a position of strength and momentum. Who's the new president going to be? What direction are they going to take the university that's now a tier two research university? The campus is double or triple size since I graduated even in 2012. So um, once again, right, amazing time to be a Duke. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like 
every time we have Dave on, I just get so excited. Like, I don't, maybe it's the way he frames and presents. That's why he's so good at his freaking job. But like when I hear him and talk about the programs, um, he just brings such a great, unique voice and tone. Um, I, I'm hyped up and I can't wait for the spring game on April 20th. It's going to be a good time. And before we get to see Gary Butler's comment that just came on the screen, all credit to Jeff Bourne. I mean, again, a 25-year career, 25-plus year career that's that's going to be ending the way it's ending. Um, not only all credit to Jeff Bourne, but I'm so excited that this is the uh, the going away party we get to throw for him. But before Steve hops on, going back more about Bourne, I remember the message boards in 2013, 2014, the 18 to 24 months quote that he had and all the fire and brimstone and the pitchforks about Jeff Bourne and I mean, just talk about someone playing the long game and seeing the bigger vision. It's just really impressive and just w what a way to go out on top. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the, the monitoring, uh, I'll never look at the word monitoring again. Exactly. Um, <laughs> looking at it in a completely different way now with uh, with JB, and, and he's the GOAT, and we've got to uh, kind of make sure we celebrate him. He's definitely on the on the tail end. Um, my folks, or I'm hearing folks say that we're with the new ADs. I think the Board of Visitors is actually doing an interview. Okay. Um, next week or this week, um, they've got it narrowed down, and I think it's supposed to be out in the next couple of weeks. I think before April's over, we're going to know who the new AD is. Um, I'm hearing we're going to know who the interim president is as well. I don't know if that's true. It should be because um, President Alger is is out in June, and I think I saw something where he's recused himself from the interview with the AD um, going forward, which makes sense. Um, I, I couldn't be more stoked. I mean, I, I agree with you guys. I love having student athletes on. Um, I think it's one of the more special parts of the, of the program. Having both of these guys on, these are these are unbelievable representatives for the university. And, and there's tons of people behind them. They're, they're not the only ones. We're going to have more of these folks on um, over the next you know couple months. We'll have more of these players on. Um, Rigor, I just love having him on. I mean, he, he could probably be on every week if he didn't have a life. Um, I mean, I, I love having him just talk about stuff that's going on. And I, I can't push it hard enough for the folks out there that are true fans. You've got to listen to his interviews. Um, they're in-depth interviews. They're like 60 minutes type interviews on sports. Um, and so if you really want to get a really understanding of what's happening, and Coach Chesney's giving him a behind the scene, letting him in uh, to see a lot of stuff. I think uh, Coach P is going to do the same thing. Uh, it's just great. And it was fun to watch him in Brooklyn. He was having such a good time. Um, at his desk, he was, um, I watched him talk to Ian Eagle, um, and I knew Ian Eagle from, I lived in New York when he was on WFAN. Um, but I can, I'm just so excited and the football team, especially after going to scrimmage yesterday with Michael, we had a great time. We, we brought, um, I brought Alice, he brought Courtney. Um, I think it's the first time Courtney had been down like on the field and, and kind of saw, you know, a lot of that stuff. We, and it's, it was just unbelievable to watch the spirit and the camaraderie. And I just haven't seen it. Uh, they, I know they have it. I know you always have it. Every team says they're a brotherhood. Um, this one, I actually believe. I mean, this, yeah, I mean, everybody has to say it, but I saw it, and Michael saw it. I mean, these guys are unbelievably tight in April, April sixth. <laughs> this looks like this looks like November eighteenth. That's what it looks like right now. And if this is any indication of where we're going to be. In August, and I know there's a lot of work to do, and I'm not. I know you guys think I overhype stuff. I'm not overhyping this. Um, Jacob wasn't overhyping it, and Rickard's not. So you know, I've got corroborating evidence, which is in my world. I've got evidence other than my own hype to tell you that you're in great hands, and um, and I love what they're doing. It's just um, outstanding. I can't wait for the spring game. To Taylor's point, please make plans to come. Um, if you've got something else to do on that Saturday, move it. You can do yard work another day. Um, you got a birthday party to go to. Nobody really wants you there. They want the present. Drop the present off and come to Harrisonburg and come watch the Dukes. Um, we're going to be there with streamers. We're going to tailgate. Um, we're going to have a blast. And they want to see it. Jacob Dobbs' parents want to see the streamers fly. He was talking about that on Rigard's interview. Um, all the parents, they're going to come. We had tons of parents yesterday. On June, it was junior day, and they had just the stands, the visiting stands behind us. We had a bunch of people uh, from parents coming for junior day. Um, so, you know, let's let's pack it out on, on that day and let's have a blast. And if you're coming up on Friday for some reason and you're dropping by one of those golf tournaments, we're going to be doing a live podcast from the JMU Alumni Golf Tournament on uh, the 19th. Um, so feel free to drop by and, and say hello. And um, 
you know, I, I, I'm just so daggone excited. It feels like it's, um, it's right before August 31st for me. Well, gentlemen, another great episode. Uh, before we go, just want to once again, Montpelier Collective, uh, go on there, check out the coach for today for the spring game. I want to thank them, Skyline Financial, Where's Woody, great supporters of the show. They allow us to do a lot of what we do. And uh, just want to thank all the fans that continue to listen and uh, DM us, reach out to us and tell them how much they enjoy this show. Uh, we it, it means a lot because I don't think the three of us, four of us, John and Chandler, we I can't say uh, thank you enough to Chandler, who you guys don't see a lot, but he's the one pushing all the buttons and making sure everything works on the back end. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chandler. John, you were missed. I can't wait till I don't have to be the host again. Uh, so, uh, but from uh, from everyone at Sound Off, have a good night. Go Dukes. <laughs>